just goes round and round and round in circles. Does that track? You can never really find a, an end point to it, which is sort of the the whole point, really. Hi guys, how you doing? Nick Jennison, Guitar Interactive, GI Plus. It is Monday. We are doing the things that we do on Monday, which is hang out and talk about the guitar. Specifically today, we are continuing our discussion on the topic of sequencing, but we're turning our attention to the fast stuff. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, going through a, ooh, let's call it a, a journey of discovery when it comes to uh, not just playing sequences, but how you can play more logical sounding things, if that makes sense. Now, this is something that's been on my mind recently because, uh, you know, been, uh, I've had a little bit of a, a break from gigging while Nam's been on and all that sort of thing. And, you know, returning to the stage, you kind of start to think, well, you know, wouldn't it be cool if I could maybe try and connect with an audience a little more with my playing rather than, uh, you know, just blaring notes at them. and. Of course, the answer to this is playing stuff that people can mentally, uh, I guess, mentally absorb and make sense of in the moment. And this also extends to your fast playing. We're going to be talking a little bit about this today and how you can use sequences to not only make your fast playing sound more cogent, more co more co easy for me to say, more coherent, but also how you can get the most out of the chops that you have and the positions that you know on the fretboard. So we'll be going over some essential sequences that you should probably know. We've also got a little bit of housekeeping to do because in case you guys missed it last week, we have a very exciting announcement. So let's get straight to it. First of all, if you're enjoying what we're doing on these streams, a little a collection of ways that you can help us, uh, you can do the following. If you want to help us keep doing what we're doing, you can give the video a thumbs up on whatever platform you happen to be watching on. You can give us a uh, share with your guitar playing friends. That'd be very cool. If you share this video with guitar players that you know, that would mean a lot to us because it means we can reach more and more guitar players with these streams. Also, you can uh, go and check out uh, not just GI+, Plus, which is our lesson platform, but you can go and check out the lesson platform that we are merging with, which is, of course, the Mighty Lick Library. Now, in case you missed it, these streams, uh, GI+, Plus, the lesson platform that goes along with these streams, are joining forces with the venerable Lick Library. Now, Lick Library is the oldest and, in my opinion, best name in online guitar tuition. Really exciting stuff. So as of the 1st of March, GI Plus will be available as part of your Lick Library subscription. Uh, now, we talked about this last week at some length, so if you want to know a little bit more about it, uh, we'll go into some more detail today, but the thrust of it is that every lesson that's currently available on GI Plus will be available on Lick Library. So if you are a Lick Library subscriber, you'll, all, you'll get all the GI Plus lessons included in your subscription. If you're a GI Plus subscriber, you will get all of the Lick Library lessons, of which there are thousands, and I mean that, thousands, genuinely a huge library of lessons as part of your GI Plus subscription for a limited time. So we're going to be moving everything across the Lick Library. This all happens on the 1st of March, but don't worry, you will still be able to access all the GI Plus lessons for the time being on the current site. So if you're midway through a course, don't worry, we're not just gonna take it away from you. We're not gonna pull the rug out from under you. This is something uh, that will happen fairly gradually. If you have any questions about this, drop us an email, right? Because uh, one of the things Lick Library does really, really well is customer support. We have, uh, I think, the best customer support in the business uh, as far as online guitar tuition goes, not just in terms of uh, things like this, but also the fact that we offer one-to-one -one coaching as part of your membership. So as part of your membership, not a lot of people take advantage of this, part of your membership, you get access to one-to-one face-to-face coaching, as well as guidance from an actual guitar player uh, on where you should go next with your lessons. So we know a lot about the lessons that are in there. We can help you uh, if you're a little bit lost, if you feel a bit overwhelmed with the lessons. But anyway, if you want to know a bit more about the merger, just do us a favor and send us an email at playersupport at licklibrary.com and we will answer any questions that you have about the switch over. That is our buddy Stuart Shields who will be handling all of that stuff. He's a great guy. He will sort you out. So if you've got any questions, Email shields on that 
email address. Sorry, something's just cooking away down here. I had to switch it off. So there you go, playersportlicklibrary.com. That is going to uh, give you... Um, We'll give you all the answers you need there. I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, as we go on. So a quick question from there. Justin Ray is asking, so is GI Plus closing its doors? It is and it isn't. So uh, the site will be available for a little bit longer uh, just to help people ease over the transition. But we are moving everything to Lick Library. So it will eventually, it's only going to be available on Lick Library. But that's all right because that means for... Uh, your membership fee, you get access to Lick Library as well, which is nuts. So we'll talk to you more about that as we go on. So anyway, uh, some quick uh, hellos before we get too deep into today's session. Got a lot of stuff to go over today, so we're going to try and get through this as quickly as we can. But I do want to say hello to you guys because I love having you on board. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome. It's lovely to have you. If you're a returning streamer, welcome. It's lovely to have you. Marcin is the first one in the house, of course. We're both playing PRS today. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying it's because I've been looking at Marcin's PRS a lot, but, you know, I have all these beautiful PRS. I've been really enjoying playing my Maybach lately, but I have all these beautiful PRS kicking around over here and shot, and I'm like, you know what, I should probably play one, especially for the Shred thing, because this guitar really, really goes. It's crazy. Uh, so, Marcin, lovely to see you. Uh, Response Audio is in the house. Says, hi, Nick. Hi, Marcin. Hi, guys. Hope you're having a great Monday. Having a pretty good Monday as Mondays go, man. I, I love hanging out with you guys and talking about the guitar so hey that's a big win in my book uh pj is in the house says hi guys hi nick mondays are always great especially between eight and nine well i appreciate that man it's a highlight in my day as well uh larry warren is here larry lovely to see you uh chris brown is here under the guise of a uh, night train official says hi guys i'm back this week i've been watching uh the last few on catch up nick i'm still getting a huge amount of value from the josh smith guest stream well thanks man i appreciate that that was a really great stream and Josh had some uh, fantastic insights for us. So if you haven't watched that, make sure you go and catch it. It is available on the Guitar Interactive YouTube channel. So Josh Smith guest stream, definitely worth your time. We'll hopefully be doing some more of these guest streams with uh, more artists as we go forward. But a few really good ones thus far. Josh Smith was uh, a real highlight, but Jared James Nichols, also a killer guest stream uh so anyway we'll say some more hellos timothy appling is here timothy lovely to see you uh i knew recognized the scale from last week the phrygian scale i've been practicing and getting uh reacquainted with the scales this week uh if you don't use them you lose them for sure now a quick uh semantic difference on this very quickly so the phrygian scale uh it it is you could consider this the phrygian scale the scale we were using last week it was this box position where we played this bit but in context it was the e natural minor scale so it's a little confusing we'll get a bit deeper into that we do have a course uh if you want a little bit of a deeper understanding of modes available as part of your gi plus membership which will soon be available as part of your lick library membership which is of course mastering modes part one i think it's a really cool and valuable course uh you can expect part two and more coming soon because we're going to be able to do that that's part of the uh the big news with the lick library uh merger is that we get to make more courses it's very cool uh so we'll explain the difference a little bit further as we go on so if you want to know a little bit more about that let me know i'll answer it in the q a section and we'll answer why it's the uh natural minor scale and not the phrygian scale even though even though it's the phrygian scale shape nobody said guitar is easy uh, um maybe i did i don't know that's the sort of thing i would say i'm sure anyway uh pj says uh Tip of the Appling certainly do, but it will come back uh, quick with a vengeance, for sure, referring to the use it or lose it thing. Kim is in the house. Uh, great to see you. We were chatting just the other day. Sacred God Slayer is in the house. Lovely to see you. You're in time for the Shred thing, uh, our Italian Shred correspondent. Uh, who else do we have? Mark Crandler is here. Lovely to have you on board. David Yates is here. Um, hello, guys. Good to uh, NBC here. I'm not sure what that means. I feel like I'm, I'm missing a very obvious thing there, but it's Good to have you. Uh, Mark McNish is here. Uh, hello all, hey Nick. Uh, my GI Plus is up to date and ready for the merge. Excited to see what's coming next. We've got some really exciting stuff for you. Uh, been sitting on some stuff ready for this merge as well because we didn't want to go and launch a bunch of cool stuff and then have this big 
uh, changeover happens. So really exciting stuff coming. Uh, helmet strap is in the house. Lovely to see you. Daryl Queen is here. Uh, work at the best of me last week, but glad to uh, be able to be here. I'm guessing at home stream today uh, evening. All lovely to see. You. Great to have you on board. Daryl is a returning streamer and a fine, very very welcome contributor to what we're doing here. It's lovely to have you on. Uh, Steve McD is in the house. Steve, lovely to see you. Been looking at the Lick Library stuff. I think you're going to get a real kick out of it. Uh, it's going to be nice to be able to um, talk about the stuff that's on both sites as well, because I do work for both brands. So it's going to be nice to be able to bring them all under one umbrella. Uh, who else do we have? Daryl Queen, uh, once again. Uh, I think I've already highlighted that, but Daryl, still great to have you. Uh, Cowcat is here. Cranky Tom is in the house. Uh, says, oops, no, may uh, oops, no, may back. Easy for me to say. It's PRS day today. Don't worry. You know, it's one of those things. I still play my PRS all the time, but I just realized I haven't played it on stream very much lately. Uh, Marcin says, it's Ibanez RG time. Oh, yeah, nice. We love an RG. Uh, my RG is still not in uh, workable condition. I should really get my soldering iron out and fix it because... It's probably not a difficult job. Uh, it just doesn't make a sound at the moment. So, unfortunately, I can't play it. Uh, Craig is in the house. Craig has his pointy guitar at the ready. Very, very nice. Uh, John Mack is in the house. Uh, says, great news regarding the Lick Library merger. Man, I'm excited for it, too. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're stoked for it. Nick Harrison is here. My good friend, Nick. Nick is always one with the uh, sparkling insights. Always love it to have you. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, very, very quickly, we're going to see if there's anybody we haven't said hello to black crow busker is here uh we got some cool stuff on sequences food for thought on those we'll get to that in just a bit steve ford is in the house love to have you and last but not least uh we're gonna answer this question now uh witty 1960 cs thoughts on the v40 versus the new victory deputy in case you guys have missed it uh, i'm even wearing a victory shirt today um that was purely by accident um yeah, so uh, we'll talk about that. The V40 is lurking about here. The new deputy is, I can stretch, right here. Uh, both fantastic amps. We will talk about that in the Q&A section, but the deputy is more my kind of thing. Uh, fundamentally, the difference between the two is the deputy has a bit more gain. Um, and uh, it has a little, I guess, a little more versatile, although the um, the V40 is a great sounding amp. It's capable of a lot more gain than maybe people realize. Uh, it's capable of some British sounds too, which is pretty cool for me. Deputy's where it's at, I think, out of those. But I'm, I'm a gain hound, so, you know, take that for what it's worth. I do love them both. Uh, I think if I had to choose, I would probably choose the Deputy. Anyway, uh, let's get into the meat of today's session. Just a quick reminder, if you haven't done so already, remember, give this video a thumbs up, share this with the guitar playing friends. We'd like to get this out to as many guitar players as we possibly can. Anyway, on to sequences and how they can help you get the most out of your fast guitar playing. So last couple of streams we've been doing a bunch of stuff on using sequences to create melodic passages. We use the examples of things like Parisian walkways uh, where we have essentially a sequence that might read something a bit like this while we play. Now, I can't play any more of that for the sake of copyright, but we might get something, uh, we might consider that rather to be a sequence that could be seven notes going down, one, two, blah, 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 and then the first two notes of that seven again. So you could call it seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, seven, six, if you wanted to. Now, the reason I bring this up is this is to get you guys considering these sequences from a logical perspective. Uh, and from a logical perspective, what I mean is we start to think about them uh, as less of an esoteric musical concept and less of a sound. We still consider the sound, but more of kind of a mathematical thing if that makes sense. Uh, oh my god, right, Wadey was learning Parisian walkways this weekend. Fantastic, great track. Uh, we're not going to be doing that one today for copyright reasons. Uh, and also, if you want to learn that, hey, you'll get it on Lake Library. It's great. They've got some fantastic tuition. If you want to learn songs, that's the place to be. Also, all sorts of other stuff too. Um, but 
what we might start to consider as far as sequences is we might start to categorize a sequence in terms of the number of notes that are in it and how they move. Let me give you a few examples that we've done over the previous weeks and we'll expand out from there. So um, let's talk about the descending Phrygian scale. I, I'm, I'm pausing for thought because I want to be careful how I frame this because uh, our friend Timothy Appling was talking about the Phrygian scale. Let's talk about that shape that we played last week. So in case you missed it, let me take a second to show you the shape in question is going to be this. So if we start on our high E string, we're going to be playing the key of E minor. If we have a shape that goes 12, 10, 8, 12, 10, 8, on the next string, G string, we'll play 11, 9, 7, and then 10, 9, 7, 10, 9, 7, 10, 8, 7. We could consider this shape to be the notes of E minor laid out starting on E and finishing on B, or starting on B and finishing on E, depending upon how you want to look at it. It goes over the course of two and a little bit octaves, but ultimately what we end up with is three notes on every string, each string having a high note, a middle note, and a low note. The shapes in question, the fingering shapes we play, we could call the stretchy shape, like this. And we've got three of those, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then we have four, two, one shapes. I call that, sorry, four, three, one shapes, four, three, one. I say that because that's the fingers we use, four, three, and one, four, three, and one. And then on the bottom string, we have a four, two, one shape. Four, two, one, piece of cake. So what we get is we get stretchy shape, stretchy shape, stretchy shape, four, three, one, four, three, one, four, two, one. Now this is important because each one of these strings has a a high note, a middle note, and a low note. And we're gonna start thinking in those terms. So what I want you to do, we're gonna try playing some stuff together. Let's try playing on our, on each individual string, we're gonna play a sequence, a sequence of highs, middles, and lows. Let's just establish which ones they are. First, on the high string, we have our high note, we have our middle note, we have our low note. And this is just to get us used to this concept. So let's begin. Back and track is on. Beg your pardon. Let's try playing on the highest string. High, middle, then low. And we're gonna get this. Let's go high, middle, low. And again. Let's play on the next string. High, middle, low. Take a turn. High, middle, low. One more time. Now on the next string, let's go high, middle, low. Take a turn again. High, middle, low. One more time. High, middle, low. Next string, we play high, middle, low. We get the gist. High, middle, low. Next one, we play high, middle, low. And again. We might as well do the last string for argument's sake. Now that's a lot of fun, but it's quite slow, and we're here to play some fast stuff. So let's try changing it up. Let's try playing a little faster. Let's go. Now this is a sequence we could call high, middle, low, high, middle, low. Meaning that we play high, middle, low twice on each string. Here we go. Okay, let's change it up. Let's go low, middle, high. Just for argument's sake, low, middle, high. And again, we'll play each one twice on each string. It's quite quick, don't worry about it. That's the idea, here we go. Okay, let's try doing middle, high, low. We'll play that two times. Let's 
Let's do middle, low, high. Middle, low, high. Here we go, two times. Oh, once again, that was my mistake. Ready? Here we go. Now, you get the gist with this. There's lots of variations of this that we can play. This high, this middle, this low. We can string them together in a whole bunch of different ways. And we've done many of them, but not all of them in that previous example. Now, let's do a little bit of a test. And let's see if we can test our maximum speed playing a sequence versus playing straight through the scale. Now, this is where I want to know from you guys which one you're able to go faster with and which one feels easier and more natural. I can tell you right away I know which one it is for me. But the ways we're going to approach this is we're going to play straight through our scale. I'll go to both hands cam for this. Going straight through the scale. Once again, it's stretchy shape, stretchy shape, stretchy shape. 4, 3, 1, 4, 3, 1, 4, 2, 1. That's how we play them. Now, we're going to begin by playing high, middle, low, high, middle, low on each string. So we play two times through before we move on. And as far as how you choose to play this, you can pick it, you can do legato, you can do currently picking, I don't really mind. We're going to compare that against going straight from the top of the bottom of the scale to the bottom of the scale, like this. So let's compare them. Let's go. First our sequence. Here we go. And yes, the sequence takes longer, but that's okay. Okay, let's go a little faster. Let's go. Again, sequence. Okay, let's try straight down. Again. Sequence. Okay, let's go. Then the sequence, once again. Here we go. And then straight down we go. Again. Sequence. Oh, sorry. Sequence two, three, four. Okay, let's go faster again. Let's go. For those of you that are really brutally fast with this stuff, versus. Woo, that's hard. Um, I'm not sure I can do that with picking. Uh, That's pretty quick. There's a sequence. It's still pretty tough. No, oh, very, very hard. Very, very hard. Very hard. Now, we are getting into some frankly stupid speeds there, so we don't need to worry about that. If you get to the end and you're going, what was that at the end? I can't keep up with that. Don't worry, that was bonkers. You don't ever need to play that fast. That is like sport guitar territory. Uh, if you want to, that's cool, right? If that's if that's your art, then rock on. Um, but anyway, uh, what you probably found, and this is what I want to know from you, is uh, from our friend Helmet Strap, uh, has come out with a, a very interesting observation on this. I want to know, did you find it easier to play straight from the top of the scale down to the bottom of the scale, or did you find it easier to play with the sequence. Now, most folks will find it easier when we get a bit, a bit up to speed to play with the sequence. And the reason for this, I'm not 100% sure about. Uh, Marcin is kind of hitting the nail on the head with chunking, which is what it could well be. It gives us more time on each individual pair of strings. I think it just means we don't have to change as fast. We don't have to adapt to new string positions as quickly. We get to spend more time in one part of the fretboard. We get to take our time over getting all the way across the guitar's neck. The same is true when we start to play this way across the fretboard, which we'll do too. Now, 
The other thing with this crank that Tom has rightly pointed out is an even number of notes per string, which can definitely help. So an even number of notes per string for sure can help. But if we expand it out to say, uh, here's another one for David Yates to sing, the uh, pick slant is universal in the sequences, uh, for sure. Um, we got another one from Daryl Queen, who's saying also the sequences help make sure your string changes happen on an upstroke, for sure. Now. The thing is though, watch this. If we then go to a nine note sequence, which is uh, high, middle, low, high, middle, low, high, middle, low. Now it's odd numbers of notes. And now it doesn't change on the same pick stroke. Probably easier again. Uh, it's easier. Pull offs. silly but we can really go with that versus lightning that's hard oh uh, yeah so with there we've now got an odd number of notes and the pick slant changes Although I might have been doing some cheatery there, who knows? Uh, maybe I'll have to review that footage and see exactly what's going on with the pick in hand. But even there, the sequence was easier. It's way easier than going straight across the, uh, the, the scale. Now, here's another thing. If we asked you to fill a large amount of musical space, would you find it easier with the sequence or with running straight up and down the scale? Well, let's look at what we'd have to do. Let's say we wanted to fill the space from the first little part of our track, which is in the key of E minor, through to, uh, it's on the E minor chord, through to the C chord. Let me show you where the chords change. In fact, you know what? Let's go to these cameras. There's the E minor. Here's the C. So if we started here, with sequences. If we try to see that running straight up and down scales, we have trouble. Limey. Tough. Whereas, again, try and do it with sequences, we go... Now, admittedly, got a little bit unmoored from the beat there, but... It's just to show you the reason that we might choose sequences for this sort of thing. Now, the reason for this is not just because it has a musical flow, but also it's a little bit easier. It's a bit more easy on the fingers, let's say. A bit more easy on the brain as well. Now, everyone is chiming in saying the sequences are easier. I can totally wholeheartedly agree with this. Uh, lots of great... Uh, you guys are speaking the language here, by the way, which is something I'm just chuffed to bits at. We're getting the chunking discussion. Uh, now, this is something we've chatted about on stream before. We won't get super deep into that today, but uh, I got some uh, very flattering comparisons with Key Marcello. Key Marcello is the man. Like, what an athlete on the guitar. I mean, great guitar player, like 100%, fantastic guitar player, but also, like, just, like, freak athlete. Uh, one of those kind of, like, Usain Bolt type guitar players. He's just got the twitchy thing going on. Uh, which I like to think I have a little bit of, but there's people out there who have it you know, way in excess of what I can do, like the Sean Lanes of this world, uh, and the Baitios and all that sort of, sort of stuff. Um, now, let's talk about uh, the other side of this, which PJ has rightly, uh, rightly pointed out, which is the sequence is more melodic and also adds to the beat, for sure. Now, the sequence, in addition to giving us an easier time of moving through our scales, it also means that we get more of a musical flow and like little mini motifs. This is a really good one. Uh, a really good one here from Daryl Queen. It says motifs. Uh, I like how they're little motifs. We get these little motivic ideas um, within our fast lines. And that gives the audience, or the listener at least, something to latch onto with the fast stuff. And it means they can start to make sense of it. And if an audience can make sense of it, then we, the player, 
can make more sense of it more easily as well. So that's kind of an important thing, right? It helps us make sense of it, helps the listener make sense of it. So let's get into some sequences that you might like. So we're gonna change scale for this one just for argument's sake. We've done a lot of stuff in this position of late. Let's go to a classic position that we've done loads of stuff in too. It's loads of fun. Challenges all of our fingers. We like this one a lot. This particular shape is going to be the venerable. First position of the uh, G major scale, functioning as E natural minor. What we get is the following. We get stretchy shape on the lower string, stretchy shape on the next string, three, five, seven, three, five, seven. One, two, four fingering shapes on the next two strings, that's D and G. That gives us four, five, seven, four, five, seven. Starting at five on the B string, we get one, three, four, one, three, four. This gives us frets five, seven, and eight, five, seven, eight. This is this. Now you can pop as much, uh, you can play this in a whole bunch of different places. Uh, so these notes can be organized into a bunch of different shapes, depending upon where you want to play them on the fretboard. This is where the seven, note, seven uh, positions of the major scale and their seven respective modes comes in. It's basically just organizing this collection of seven notes in places that are easy to find them across the fretboard. So for example, we could play it here. We can play it here, which is where we just played it. We can play it here. 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 And here. And of course, the same thing. Up the octave. They're all the same thing, fundamentally. It's different fingering shapes, but ultimately it's a way of organizing the same notes so that we can access them anywhere on the fretboard. Now, they do have a different sound because of course, when we play these, certainly if we play particular sequences, we're gonna end up with different groupings of notes within each sequence. But let's take the sequences that we've done today. So what we've done so far is we've done uh, what I might call high, middle, low, high, middle, low which we can play on every string, high, middle, low, high, middle, low. We can also play high, middle, low three times, which sounds like a yodel, high, middle, low three times. We get this. High, middle, low three times. Here it is two times. fine sequences, really quite good. Now, we can also do other sequences that only really apply on a single string. A favorite of mine that we've done loads of before is high, low, middle, high, middle, low. I'll say that again. High, low, middle, high, middle, low. This is the Yngwie 6, where we go high, low, middle, high, middle, low. High, low, middle, high, middle, low. High, low, middle, high, middle, low. Now the beauty of this style of thinking is you can apply this to any of these three note per string shapes and then you've something musical that you can move to any given position. So let's apply that one over our backing track. <coughs> I beg your pardon. It's too busy putting the track on, missed the cough button. So let's try going like this. Let's try playing. High, little, little, high, middle, low. Now, if you need a bit more time with that, just play along at any pace you want. But we are going to speed it up. Speed it up, we get something like this, where we get... Speed it up again, we get this. You should have heard me play a thousand times, I'm sure. Challenge you to pick, but even still good fun. Now, of course, if it works here, it also works here. 
And it works, go between the two. Oh, miss. Let's go again. Uh. You get the gist of that. Now, that's a sequence that works in any three-note string position. There are lots of other sequences we can dream up that we could play on a single string that we can then move back and forward in different strings. We could play one that started at the, t the bottom of the string, went to the top and back again. So we could go low, middle, high, middle, low, which is a five note sequence. Useful. We can do the opposite. We can go high, low, sorry, high, middle, low and back again. This works really well if we do low to high and back again on the bottom. Sorry, on the highest string. And then high to low and back again on the next string. So we get this. We've got some uh, comments coming in here asking if you guys can post links. Of course you can post links. Please do. If you have links, share them. We'd love to see them, right? Of course you can post links. Uh, this is not this is not a one-way discussion here, right? This is this is a group thing, right? You guys are more than welcome to share links. Please don't feel like you have to ask. Just get them shared. Uh, I'd love to see them. So that's one of those examples. Now, other things we can do with this is we can start to think in terms of groupings and in terms of intervals. Now, groupings and intervals are something different. Groupings are where we play groups of a certain number of notes starting on a given note, and then we do the same number of notes, but starting one note further up or down the scale. An example of this might be playing groups of four. So groupings of four, if we took this scale here, for example, what we could play is we could play this. We could play four notes descending. We'd start on this note. We could then start here and play four notes descending. We can start here and play four notes descending. And we get something like this. That would be an example of a scale moving in groupings of four to a track. It might sound like this. Lots of fun in this higher position. That's pretty cool. We like that an awful lot. We've got a cool one from Chris Brown saying, sometimes make use of the Paul Gilbert style legato patterns. We're going to get to that now. Uh, hopefully we'll get to that. Hopefully we'll have time to get to that. I'm sure we will. If not, we'll pick it up next week. Uh, another example of this might be if instead of groupings of four, we did groupings of three. And this, to me, always sounds like Randy Rhodes. Um, this is the, it's the, if you've ever learned the Mr. Crowley solos, they have all this. Now that wasn't a line from the solo, but it could probably conceivably be one. Whatever that line goes like. Uh, all that sort of stuff. Groupings of three, it just sounds like Randy to me. And it's a cool sound, right? We love a bit of Randy Rhodes. So let's talk about what they are. This, uh, let's say, yes. And I do dictate that it is, right? And there you go. Uh, Zar Nicholas um, dictates that it is. So uh, anyway, the uh, groupings of three, if we played it in this position, here's what it would look like. We would play one, two, three notes descending. Start here. One, two, three notes descending. Start here. One, two, three. Start here. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. 
to practice these, this little broken up way of playing them, very useful. We don't just have to do threes, we can do fours, we can do fives, we can do sixes. Let's do sixes. I'm certain I missed some there, but sounded pretty cool, so we're going to leave it be. But that three is descending, very, very cool, very useful. Let's compare. So, if we get something like this, what do we get? Loads of fun, right? We go... You get fast at this stuff, and you can just cook with this. It sounds like this lovely cascading sounds very 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 good fun of course uh, he's another one that's been mentioned uh we we've got our daryl queen yeah with the uh fives the eric johnson joe bonamassa fives sure play pentatonic scales eric johnson joe bonamassa move in fives so you get this sort of effect For some reason i was trying to play that a bit slower Now that is an example of the same thing, but this time, just to, to make it semantic difference here, which is totally fine, this is not a better worse situation. It's just a, what do you prefer? When we take, let's take A minor pentatonic, for example. Uh, if we take the classic Eric Johnson fives, to truly play descending fives, we would have to start on each note of the pentatonic scale. We'd go here, then start here. Then here, then here, which is not really what Eric does. Joe does that, Bonamassa does that, Eric doesn't really do it. It's quite hard as well. So on and so forth. What Eric is doing is rather than starting on each individual note of the scale, he's just starting the sequence on the highest note of each string. And that can work too, that can be really cool. So if we take sixes, for example, and instead of starting on each individual note of the string, so on and so forth, what we can do is we can just start on the highest note of each string and play six notes down, like this. Loads of fun and dead, dead easy. Now, uh, other ways we can do this, There's, there are examples of some groupings. We don't have to do groupings. We can also do intervals. Now, sequences, as far as intervals go, we could do a scale played in not threes, but in thirds. Now, what this might look like is if we were to do essentially just the highest and lowest notes of our group of three, or you could think about it as a play one, miss one kind of setup. So if we do a, a scale here, we can go play one, miss one, and then start one note lower than we did in our previous one. So we start here, we can go here next, play one, miss one, play one, start here, play one, miss one, play one, start here, play one, miss one, play one. You get this. Same thing. Let's put it in the track. So let's go. Uh, let's do groupings of four. Uh. Let's do groupings of three. Let's do intervals of three. Play one, miss one. They all have slightly different sounds to them, but here's the thing. The bigger your collection of sequences that you have available to you, the uh, the more, it, for you guys asking me post links, post links, 
go for it. Post doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's safe for work. Post if it's musical, post links. That's what I'll say. Um, musical. So anyway, uh, oh, we're about to start playing "Who's Crying Now" by Journey. Uh, it's not a million miles off. You hear these sequences in uh, all manner of musical um, settings, and that's an example of one. So the uh, I guess Sean does do an awful lot of that play one miss one doesn't he now that i think about it yeah he really does um it's interesting to see how different players gravitate to different sequences but here's the thing if you have enough of a collection of these sequences and you start to mix and match them it stops sounding super patterny and starts sounding musical in that there's little motifs but it has a flow to it so we'll do a little bit of spotting i guess right so if i play a bit of this uh i'm going to see how many of these sequences you can spot i'm going to try not to go at hyper speed here because it's very tempting on this guitar this guitar really shreds but we'll try not to go super crazy speed but just see how many of these you can spot We've got some spots for the sevens timing for sure, which is the next thing I was going to talk about with this, which is part of the magic of this is to take a uh, to take a, a grouping or a sequence and try playing it in a way, or try playing it in a rhythmic timing where the sequence doesn't line up the same way every time you play it. An example of this might be something like the Led Zeppelin song, Cashmere, where you hear uh, a rhythm guitar phrase that moves in groups of three, even though the song is in 4-4. Four, four. So what you end up with is you end up with a, uh, a riff that starts in a different beat every time you play it. You can do that with your sequences. Now I like to get a little tricksy with this and try playing six note groups over a sevens subdivision. You don't need to worry about that. Or we'll play fives over a four subdivision, fours over a five subdivision, whatever. That is where these things start to get kind of interesting because you can still hear a thread through them. They just sound a bit more, I guess a bit more out there. And if you're able, like I say, to chop and change between these, that's a really exciting thing. So listen, guys, we're going to turn our attention to the Q&A. So uh, if you've got questions, we've got answers. But before we do, I want to take a second and show you this. This is a quick reminder for you folks who've maybe just joined us. We will soon be joining our compatriots over at licklibrary.com, which is going to be the new home for all of the GI Plus lessons. This is a little look at what you get. When we come back, we'll be answering your questions. So drop them down below. Drop us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Hi, my name's Nick Jennison, and it's my pleasure to announce that GI Plus, the exclusive lesson platform from Guitar Interactive Magazine, is moving to licklibrary.com. GI Plus features a whole host of the best players and educators in the world, bringing you exclusive lessons on everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about Sweet Picking with Rick Graham? Or maybe country's more your bag. Well, how about a full-length country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Members also get access to every lesson ever published in Guitar Interactive magazine, including Michael Caswell's legendary Pro Concepts column. Or 
Or maybe you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members can access to over 70 full-length tech sessions where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmour, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Slash, Toshi Nabasi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. And you get all of this in addition to all of the amazing content on LickLibrary.com, which includes note-for-note -note tuition of over 60 classic albums, weekly lesson uploads, a backing track library, and one-to-one -one player support. There has never been a better time to sign up than right now. So there you go, guys. A quick reminder. We are joining forces with our friends over at Lake Library. You will be able to access all of your GA Plus lessons, if you remember, on the current site. So fear not, it's not going anywhere just yet. But eventually, we are moving everything across the Lake Library. That changeover is going to happen on the 1st of March. Really excited for that. That is a huge partnership. It means we're going to be able to make a bunch of amazing lessons for you guys. Now, let's take a quick look at some questions. First of all, I want to head this off. Now, I'm never one to uh, very forcefully disagree with my good friend Nick Harris, and I respect him very deeply, but Kashmir is most definitely in 4-4. And I will hear no argument on that, because listen to the vocal melody, right? Vocal melody. Phrasing is in four. Drums are in four, right? The metric modulation is happening on the harmonic instruments, not on the... Uh, it's in four. It's in four. I'll hear no argument on that. <laughs> just being a pain in the bum. Uh, I get the impression Nick's probably just arguing for the sake of arguing there. Now, um, this particular song, in case you... I'm sure you'll have heard it. I'm sure you'll have heard it. Uh, is the musical equivalent of the uh, white and gold or blue and black dress. Uh, it's been dividing musicians forever. Um, is it in four? Is it in three? It's in four. Anyway, so uh, a quick one, a question about the magazine. The magazine will be uh, continuing as usual. Still be free to read. Don't worry about that. The magazine is going nowhere. The magazine is still going to be uh, published uh, on a regular basis. It's going to be free to read. It's going to be exactly the same. We'll still be doing all the same interviews, same gear reviews. I'll still be doing it. Um, so, yeah. Nothing's going to change with the mag. It's going to be exactly the same as it is. And also, these streams are still going to be going on. They're going nowhere. We'll still be doing these streams every Monday. So, uh, Nick will have to do a new voiceover soon. I will have to do a new voiceover soon. I'm just keep doing voiceovers. I think people must like them. I don't know what's going on. Uh, anyway, I live five minutes from John Bonham's school, says Chris Brown. That is very cool. We like that a lot. Now, some questions. Uh, I agree. That is very cool. Now... Uh, a quick question here from, uh, oh, one from Marcin. Uh, it says, what model is that etched pickguard PRS you've got? Well, let me grab it for you, right? Because it's a really cool guitar. Uh, I'm going to pop this one down. That is a CE24. This guy, this etched pickguard model, which is currently tuned F to F. Oh, no, it's not. I've tuned it back down E to E, like a normal person. This guitar, let me just move this comment very quickly, is uh, an EG4 that I've modded very heavily. Now, EG4s... Uh, well, not a huge success for PRS. They kind of, it was a pre-factory model, so it was 1991 that this guitar was made. Uh, so it was before the, well, the factory was still basically Paul's house. It needs new strings. And it's also a little bit, a little bit microphonic, apparently. That's interesting. Let's just move a little further away from that. Oh, well, never mind. I think uh, it's just misbehaving today. Very cool guitar, let me go to this cam and give you a quick close-up. What we're dealing with here is uh, two single coils, humbucker, the single coils are angled because of the string spacing on a PRS bridge. It's not spaced for uh, F-style pickups, so they're angled, looks very 80s, very 90s, pretty cool. The etch pickguard is aftermarket, that's a uh, couple of friends of mine who run a company called Custom Cool Etch, uh, got an etched 
press rod cover as well. Also put some Fisherman Fluences in here, which are a great sounding set. Really big fan of these pickups. They're great. You guys knew that already. So that is my EG4. It's probably going to make a racket, so I might not play this one too much more, but we'll see. Uh, now, here's a cool one from Sacred Godslayer. He's asking, what do you suggest uh, to keep focused while trying to improvise and not go through the usual run-of-the-mill stuff that is ingrained by years into the hands? Well, this is where I'm going to uh, pull some stuff from my friend Nick, uh, who's been on the stream uh, a bunch of times. You guys know Nick Harrison. Um, and it's to take options away from yourself. Remove the permission to play certain things. This can look like removing certain notes from your vocabulary. So you can say, I'm not going to play the E in E minor. Or it can remove certain strings. You can say, I'm not going to play the G string, or I'm only going to play the G string. You can remove certain techniques. You can say, no pull-offs, only picking, or vice versa. Uh, you can uh, set yourself goals like phrasing on the third of a particular chord. For example, you can set rhythmic goals where you say, I'm only going to play eighth notes. I think uh, setting restrictions on your practice, especially when you're doing free form practice, I've stopped calling it improvisation, but when you're doing free form practice, where you're doing uh, exploration on the guitar, I think having some kind of like bumpers, some kind of parameters to do it within is really, really valuable. Uh, other examples might be, I'm only going to play triads, or I'm only going to play pentatonics. Again, I didn't make this stuff up. This is uh, stuff that's been given to me uh, by dear friends, Nick Harrison being one of them. Uh, so, yeah, big fan of this. There we go. It's a big yes. Uh, a principle called uh, restriction as the basis for development. That's a nice way of putting it. We like a bit of that. Now, uh, if any of you guys were on about posting links, by the way, get those links posted. I want to see them, right? We want to see them. Uh, hopefully YouTube is not crushing the links, but if you didn't quite get them, they didn't get posted for whatever reason, uh, you can always uh, come back to this video once we finished and just post them in the comments uh, and they'll be on there. So, uh, you know, uh, we want to see these links, right? I, I want to see them. I want to see what you guys have been sharing with me. Uh, yeah, for sure. Now, uh, one other real quick question that I just want to go back to here is uh, the question uh, Timothy Appling, it's not even a question, but the comments Timothy Appling had earlier on the Phrygian scale uh, and my comment where I was like, oh, it's not actually the Phrygian scale, even though it is the Phrygian scale shape. Well, let's get into this very quickly. We have a couple of minutes to do it. Uh, I'm just going to sort of put the cat among the pigeons here and say that this scale shape that we've been playing at some length, I'm just going to move this comment very quickly. This uh, first one that we've done here, it's the Phrygian scale if we play it like this. Guitar is very out of tune. Let me grab my other guitar before I mess around tuning this one. Just grab the uh, other black guitar, one of several black PRS. Uh, we'll grab the one we've been playing today because it's definitely in tune. This one here. Oh, let's go. Now, if you play this scale in this context, where this note, this B note, is the center of the scale musically and sonically. You might call it the root note. We could quite comfortably say... that this scale is E Phrygian. Sorry, B Phrygian, my mistake. B Phrygian. And that's what you get if you play the notes of B Phrygian starting on B. But the notes of B Phrygian also happen to be the notes of E minor. And if we play them in the context of a track where E minor is very clearly at the center, listen to the distortion on that spring reverb. It's loads of fun. Fab. If we play this collection of notes, even though the scale on its own would imply that, well, it's B Phrygian. That's what happens if you start here and play Phrygian. 
in this context, because the collection of notes are the notes from E minor, it's an E minor scale. It's just the E minor scale starting on B, if that makes sense. Now, this is something that takes a bit of grappling with, uh, and unfortunately, I'm, we don't have time to get into it today. But we may get into this at some other point. If that's something you guys want to know about, let me know. Let me know, because I would love to get into this in some uh, in some detail, uh, if that makes sense. The guitar is in Gaelic tuning. Uh, it, it sounded a little... Uh, it's in some kind of tuning. Um, there's a, a famous tuning uh, we used to refer to that we don't even know what the notes are, but we called it Open John. Um, it's when uh, Mama John was messing around with slide uh, backstage in some kind of open tuning, and we got the uh, the call to go on stage. And he's like, ah, and tuned his guitar uh, so that the needle was in the middle but didn't pay attention to the letters um, and just wound up with some random combination of notes. Those notes were in tune, but they were totally random. So uh, it might have been like F, A, C sharp, G, uh, B flat, F sharp. It's totally random. Um, so we called it Open John. Uh, that, is, that was tuned to Open John. Um, that's another story for another day. Uh, bizarre things that happen in green rooms, uh, including tuning. So we'll maybe get into that. Um, when is a scale B Phrygian? When is a scale E major? Uh, e, e minor? When is it G major? Etc. Uh, here's a good one from Mark Randall saying, isn't B Phrygian just the G major or E minor scale just emphasizing the B minor chord? I think it's, uh, you could absolutely call it that. I think the way I would put it is, uh, I would say it's the notes of uh, G major or the same notes as G major, the same notes as E minor. It's just that the B is the note that has the emphasis because of the harmonic setting. I'm going to use this analogy again that I've done loads of times, but I'm going to put two words on here. Uh, there we go. These words, stone and tones, have the same letters in them. But depending upon the emphasis that we give to certain letters, i.e. the order we place them in, which one goes first, which one goes at the end, they have a different meaning, even though they have the same letters in them. Thus, it's the same with uh, B Phrygian and E minor and G major. They have the same letters in them, we just give each one different levels of importance. Here's a one from Justin Ray, very quickly. Uh, economy picking versus alternate picking and how they feel against the beat could also be a factor in playing lines. It certainly could, absolutely certainly could. Uh, this is one of the strengths of strict alternate picking is that the timing can be a bit easier. Uh, although the string crossing can be more challenging. So there's definitely trade-offs to be had here. One is not better than the other. We just recognize that if you know what you gain in terms of ease of string change of economy picking, you maybe lose in terms of ease of timing. If you can believe it, we've got some people watching on Twitch. Twitch people, hello, great to have you on board. You've tuned in uh, just as we're about to go offline. But listen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm over the moon. Nobody watches us on Twitch. Everybody just watches us on YouTube. Uh, but hey, if you're watching us on Twitch, thanks for coming. Uh, we do this every Monday, 8 p.m. UK time. Play some guitar. It's good fun. Anyway, guys, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Nick Jennison, the Guitar Interactive GI+. Plus. Don't forget, we are moving to Lick Library uh, on the 1st of March. I'll tell you more about that. It's not very far away. It's like two weeks. These streams will be continuing, so fear not. This is normal. Same place. We'll be on the same channel. We'll be talking about the same stuff. It's been a lot of fun. My name is Nick Jennings from Guitar Interactive Magazine, GI+. Plus. I will continue playing some big sequences at you, and we'll see how many of them we can string together. Thank you so much for having me. I will see you guys next week. Let's go to these cameras, and let's play lots of notes. Or let's play no notes. Apparently the guitar's not working. Bear with me. How have I wronged you so, guitar? Let's grab a different guitar. Ah. Well, apparently we're not playing any notes because something's gone very wrong with the re 
reverb pedal. Ah, <laughs> that's the issue. Well, that was an easy fix. Let's just try that again one more time. Uh, for our Twitch fans, uh, kickstart my heart. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in G. And then it's awkward if you try and play it in the original key, because you have to go... Pain in the neck. You should probably play it in standard tuning, but uh, you know, hey, it is a great song. I love that song too. Now, unfortunately, we can't play the whole thing, otherwise, we'll get copyright strikes on YouTube. Twitch loves this sort of thing, YouTube, not so much, and that's where the majority of our audience is. But thanks for your question. Anyway, listen, now that the reverbs work, and let's play more notes. Hi, my name's Nick Jennison, and it's my pleasure to announce that GI Plus, the exclusive lesson platform from Guitar Interactive Magazine, is moving to licklibrary.com. GI Plus features a whole host of the best players and educators in the world, bringing you exclusive lessons on everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about Sweet Picking with Rick Graham? Or maybe country's more your bag. Well, how about a full-length country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Members also get access to every lesson ever published in Guitar Interactive magazine, including Michael Caswell's legendary Pro Concepts column. Or maybe you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 70 full-length tech sessions, where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmour, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Slash, Tosi Abasi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. And you get all of this in addition to all of the amazing content on LickLibrary.com, which includes note-for-note -note tuition of over 60 classic albums, weekly lesson uploads, a backing track library, and one-to-one -one player support. There has never been a better time to sign up than right now.